Jacques Lacan's fifth seminar is entitled Formations of the Unconscious. This translation has only been out for about 18 months or so. Russell Grigg is the uh, translator. Thank you, Russell. We are much indebted to you, particularly today, seeing as we're continuing with our topic of the Oedipus Complex in Lacan, and we will be speaking at length about the paternal metaphor. Now, for those uh, Lacan scholars out there, the paternal metaphor is the ninth chapter of this fifth seminar. It takes place on the 15th of January, 1958, and then it is followed by three consecutive chapters of the three moments, uh, discussing the three moments of the Oedipus complex. So to give you the dates, and Lacan is talking about this, we are talking about January, February, 1958, and you can find the much more detailed, much more enigmatic uh, description of some of the material that we'll be talking about today in this text and you will see that I try to color code my shirt and the book just to look good. Right, so let's get started. We have spent a lot of time thinking about the Oedipus Complex in Lacan and we've also spent a fair amount of time building up to this notion of the paternal metaphor. So we're going to say a couple of introductory comments, but first thing, just to get it right out there, right from the word outset, what is the paternal metaphor? Why do we need to be so complicated about this? Well, basically, going right to the, in a way, the conclusion, what it is, is it can be stated fairly simply, succinctly. What Lacan is struggling or managing to describe is simply how the psychological, psychic and existential compass of one's life is initially that of the mother and the mother's desire, the mother's absences, the mother's other interests. What does mom want? That is eventually supplanted with, replaced by uh, the question of the name of the father. And for Lacan, this is a metaphoric uh, process, hence the idea of the paternal metaphor. So to be as simple, as basic as possible, all we are talking about is We'll use inverted commas because Lacan wouldn't like it, but the developmental period through which that substitution takes place, that move from uh, negotiating and understanding and locating ourselves in the world via the compass of the desire of the mother is put to one side. It's repressed, you could say, pushed down, and the name of the father is thereby the key kind of compass uh, through which one negotiates psychical reality. It's, it's a substitution, or in Lacan's terms, a metaphor, a replacement of one thing by another, which has a series of really important psychical consequences. So there's many different depictions of this process, of the paternal metaphor in the Lacanian literature, in the, in the Lacan text that I've just mentioned. Of course, there are some. But I've done it just like this here, trying to keep things fairly straightforward. We have... Initially, the desire of the mother, the most important set of questions, activities, the behavioral responses through which the infant or small child locates themselves in the world, trying to get a sense of what's up. That is eventually replaced by the name of the father. That becomes the important operation. And the desire of the mother is, is beneath that, is of less importance. And not only is it beneath it, it gets pushed down, effectively repressed. Hence my crossing of the line out of desire of the mother. Let's just say why that is a metaphor and or let's say something important about that. This is in a way a process of metaphorization for Lacan. That begs some questions. Can't we just say one is substituted for or that the one is pushed down by? Well you could say those things but just remember that when Lacan is thinking about a metaphor he's still presumably thinking about it the way Freud thinks about a condensation. Why do I add this qualification? That's to say that when one op utilizes a metaphor, my standard example, because I made it up, is the inky well, and I'm trying to talk about the night sky. When I say the inky well <clears throat> is around me as I walk through the hills on that chilly evening or whatever, <clears throat> yes, you could say that the metaphor has pushed out the literal reference to the night sky, but it hasn't completely obliterated it. A metaphor doesn't absolutely efface, obliterate from the face of the earth the thing that it's metaphorically substituting for. That thing retains some presence. It retains maybe a, a, a suppressed or pushed down, maybe a kind of ghostly presence. It's still there. Remember, condensation for Freud means that there's a kind of overlap. It's overwritten. It gets pushed down. It's still present in a way. And 
that I think is still going to be true of the desire of the mother. Darren Lina uses a nice phrase where he says, after the paternal metaphor, when the name of the father becomes the matrix, the navigational grid, the way of locating oneself in the world, the desire of the mother is still important, but it's pushed down, it's repressed. And he says the mother takes up her place at the vanishing point of unconscious desire. In other words, the mother is a kind of nucleus of desire, but it has to be repressed, at least within the, the confines of the neurotic subject. It has to be repressed. It has to be pushed down. Otherwise, if your erotic life is defined by the attraction to one's mother, it's going to create some problems. Okay. So yes, desire of the mother is not fully obliterated. It is still there. It's still significant, but it's fundamentally repressed for the neurotic subject. So that, in a kind of pricey, is some of the basic operation of what's going on here with this notion of the paternal metaphor. And let's also note something interesting. For Lacan, then, it means that language or linguistic operation, the operation of metaphor, and he wants to use that as the structural description for what he thinks happens when essentially mom gets replaced by dad. That's a metaphor for him. You could say a couple of things. Number one, language is the operating system of the unconscious language is provides this linguistic operation through which subjectivity or neurotic subjectivity emerges and the name of the father and we're just emphasizing that to say that this is squarely within the domain with in which Lacan is thinking many basic facets of psychical operation within the structures of language and that's something just to bear in mind, that this is not possible without language, you could say. That's why I say language is the operating system for the emergence of this type of neurotic subjectivity. Okay, so that is kind of the main conclusion that I've already started with. But let's just add one or two more specifying ideas so that we can get a good feel for how this theory works. The first thing to say, and I kind of try to put this in a paradoxical way, is that in Lacanian theory, a minus sign is a plus. Well, or a minus sign is a good thing, or a minus sign, maybe more straightforward yet, is somehow enabling. Let's just keep that idea in mind. In Lacanian theory, a minus sign, the introduction of a kind of negativity is enabling. That's an even better way of putting it. Why would a minus sign, the introduction of negativity, be enabling? The most straightforward way, and if you've been to any kind of introductory Lacan lectures, this example's probably already come your way. Sometimes you get those little puzzles, the little blocks, and you shift them around. There's probably a name for this puzzle. And you shift them around, they come in Christmas crackers. In the United States, no one knows what a Christmas cracker is. Sorry for you guys in the United States, I'll draw you a picture. Anyways, you get a little puzzle, it's got lots of little blocks on, you have to rearrange it to make a picture. And when you first get it, it's all scrambled, and you have to try and arrange it. Now, obviously, that's not going to work unless there's one missing tile. You need one tile so you can do the rearrangement of the puzzle to make a picture. It's the most basic example of this premise. But in Lacanian theory, it runs all the way through Lacan. You'll see it again and again. You need some minus. You need some negativity. You need some lack before things can start to move. This is going to be true, too, because when we move down my very packed but beautifully prepared chalkboard, and we start to look at point number five, mother is minus sign, we will get this idea that with the paternal metaphor, the kind of suppression and repression of the desire of the mother, there is an introduction of lack, an introduction of a negativity into the life of the subject. That sounds poignant, it sounds sad in some respects, but on the other hand, it is a condition of possibility for that subject's own desire to emerge. Back to the point, why is a minus sign uh, uh, enabling in Lacan, the introduction of a certain lack, introduction of a certain negativity is necessary for the desiring subject to desire it all. If they had everything around them that they would ever possibly need, that doesn't even sound like human subjectivity, does it? But it also suggests that if there's no lack, there's no movement, there's no, that presumably there's no need to speak at all. And if there's no movement, no need to speak, nothing lacking, there's nothing desiring. In an odd sort of way, this is not a very uh, Lacanian turn of phrase, but you could say that the very freedom, the, 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 the basic underpinnings of human subjectivity to creatively engender itself needs lack, needs desire. 
One brief further example of that, just to, to underline this emblem, this, this uh, motif, which comes back again and again in Lacanian theory. Often people have heard this kind of uh, puzzling paradox where Lacan talks about anxiety as the lack of a lack. And you're like, dude, well, you know, enough with the double negatives and everything. What do you mean, the lack of a lack? One way of thinking about the lack of the lack is that the lack is necessary. It's the air you breathe. The, the air, the, without lack, there can be no desire. So the lack of the lack, in a way, is one shorthand way that he would approach the notion of anxiety because it's a kind of suffocating presence where there isn't the space for a lack with which I can breathe, with which I can desire. So that's a kind of lengthy preamble, but partly what we want to say there is two things. The paternal metaphor will mean that once the desire of the mother is no longer the crucial coordinating focus of one's life, there will be the introduction of a negativity. And that introduction of a negativity is, to risk a paradox, positive or enabling, because it means that the subject can start to desire. Let's move on to point two then. <clears throat> there are many reasons you could say that Lacanian theory amounts to a very concerted, focused, I think intelligent dialogue with the Freudian theory that's gone before it. And one of the important elements here, I think, is that often in certain readings of Freud and Freud's account of the Oedipus complex, one gets a sense that the way, particularly the boy child, is kind of moved through the Oedipus complex, is pushed through the Oedipus complex, is because of this fear of castration. We've spoken about this already. Often this seems to be overly literalized, um, but this, this is uh, the imposition of law. The, the threat of castration is what kind of pushes the boy child in Freudian terms to, to resolve Oedipus because there's something threatening, something, some castration threat that's all too awful to consider. By the time we start to use the Lacanian terminology, it's no longer simply uh, kind of father, law, whatever, although there is that as well, castration threat. We've got two crucial mechanisms. We've got both this phallus, which is the signifier of desire, signifier of lack, and we've got the name of the father, the name of the father, which indeed is the imposition of the law, but it too remains enabling because it provides a naming for the subject, a location for the subject, a situation for the subject. So what I'm saying is I think we have a little more complexity here. We've got two concepts. We've got more machinery in place to try and understand this process, which is not simply, um, is not simply the negative motivation of castration. So as I put it here, we need to keep in mind the name of the father always alongside the phallus. In Freud, it feels often that we've only got that motivation of castration to bring the Oedipus complex to a close. In Lacan, it's both the imposition of the law through the name of the father, and once this phallus, this signifier of desire, this signifier of lack is properly operating, then we have the space for our own desire to operate, the opening up of our own desire. And to reiterate, once again, I always do this, but let's just keep it in mind, when we're talking about the phallus, problematic term, whatever, I'll give you that much. Why can't we just say signifier of lack? Let's keep that in mind. It's the signifier of lack stroke desire. A phallic signifier then presumably is a signifier, okay, a word, uh, whatever, that indicates something that's desirable or indeed something that's lacking. And if we get that right, thinking about the phallic signifier or the signifier of lack in those terms, then I think we can start to appreciate why it's important within an understanding of human psychical life. It's not about penises everywhere. Oh no, too many penises. It's about lacking signif signifiers that connote lack, that in a way operate to, to incur my desire, my desire and my lack. Let's then bring this mini lecture to a conclusion and just say, that we can highlight two enabling facets of the paternal metaphor. The paternal metaphor is enabling in at least two fundamental ways. I'm relying somewhat here, and we'll give a nice quote to Stein van Hohler in the follow-up lecture. I'm relying on this book of his, which I've recommended already more than once, actually, The Subject of Psychosis, uh, a Lacanian perspective. Stein van Hohler publishes it in 2011, great book. Uh, and we will turn to a, a lengthier quote from him, but just let's quickly make that point. Of the two 
huge moves forward of the, the, the two enabling gains of this paternal metaphor. The first is which is that the desire of the mother, although it is uh, what I call a compass point or a kind of navigational set of coordinates with which to locate myself, the desire of the mother is always somewhat murky when one is dealing with this kind of imaginary uh, dynamics of what does the mother want, how can I encapsulate what she wants, how can I do the Jerry Maguire thing of trying to be everything for her. The mother's desire is a little bit enigmatic, it's a little bit opaque, it's not very easy to define. By the time we move into the name of the father, it's no longer this guesswork at the murkiness of the mother's desire. We have more precise coordinates be precisely because we're anchored firmly in the symbolic. So not only does the paternal metaphor mean that the desire of the mother is, is we've moved away from that murky enigmatic desire of the mother, but it also means that that previous attempt to be everything for the mother you could argue this is not only hopeless, but it's exhausting. To try to be everything for the mother is impossible for a start, but it's, it's the limits how one can realize one's own desire, and, and, it, and it gives you just that one kind of crucial focus and goal. It's impossible, it's exhausting, and, and it's limiting. So in that respect, the paternal operation of the paternal metaphor is going to allow much more by way of precision, much more by way of the opening up of subjective desire for the subject, rather than leaving them caught in this imaginary, dyadic, hopeless situation, remember again, black swan, of trying to be everything that the mother might want and never quite knowing what that is.